بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته brothers and sisters today I want to give a short but valuable reminder about the second most important pillar of Islam الصلاة and I'm going to refer to three verses from سورة المؤمنون Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in verse 1 and 2 أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قد أفلح المؤمنون الذين هم في صلاتهم خاشعون. And also verse nine, Allah says, والذين هم على صلواتهم يحافظون. أولئك هم الوارثون الذين يرثون الفردوس هم فيها خالدون. The meanings of these verses are as follows. Allah says, The believers have truly attained success. The ones who in their prayer are humble. And then in verse 9, 10, and 11, Allah says, and the ones who perform their prayers all the time, or the ones who guard their prayers, these are the ones who will inherit, the ones who will inherit the great paradise. In it, they will live for eternity. My brothers and sisters, as salah In English, we say prayer, but it doesn't give the full meaning of the Arabic word as salah So as salah has two meanings merged in one. It means to isolate and seclude yourself with Allah and to connect with Allah. SubhanAllah. If we don't have a connection with our Creator, we have no connection to anything else. Because everything else in this world, although we may have a connection to it, it's always temporary and it'll run out and it'll even betray us. This entire world will betray us. As the Prophet ﷺ told us in the Hadith Al-Qudsi that Allah said to the dunya, to this world, Ya dunya, uh, o dunya, O world, serve those who serve me, who serve Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and turn away from those who serve you. So my brothers and sisters, as-salah is your connection to Allah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins and opens this chapter by talking about the believers that they are the ones who truly attain success. It's as if Allah is replying to someone to make a point. So you have to know the background of this verse actually. This uh, ayah of from Surah Al-Mu'minun came down when the non-Muslims of Mecca, of Quraysh, the enemies of the Prophet Sallallahu the disbelievers, they began to uh, take pride and become arrogant and boastful over the accumulation of material possessions they had and that they started to use this uh, societal uh, norm which they made up that people's success and their uh, importance or their value is based on how much money they had, how many assets they had and properties, how many camels and lands they had, all of this is what they use to measure the person's value and importance. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them the reply by saying, oh no, the truly successful ones are the ones who have chosen to believe in Allah, follow Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's guidance, the king of the, all the world, the owner of everything in this universe and beyond, and to follow his messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, obey him and follow his sunnah. These people who are the believers, the true successful ones, not only in this world, but also in the hereafter. So brothers and sisters, those who, are, who can attain that level and have that connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first, you must believe in Allah in your heart and truly have that faith with certainty. Uh, psychologists have talked about uh, extensive studies that relate to people who have a better mental health condition in this life. And they looked at uh, prayer and meditation. Of course, this is without the Islamic side to it. They just looked at it purely from a human perspective and they found that people who have a connection with God or a higher power, some of them were delusional and others of them had a good mental state. The ones who were delusional are the ones who did not have certainty in what they believed in. They had doubt. But then they said the ones who have certainty, which in the Quran is called Yaqeen, by the way, which means absolute certainty in their faith. In Islam, Alhamdulillah, we have the truth, we have the Quran, we have the Sunnah, and it challenges anyone to prove the Qur'an wrong anyway, alhamdulillah. So 
we have certainty in Allah and what He has promised, then suddenly you'll find your mental state, your spiritual state, and everything about you, alhamdulillah, becomes serene, becomes in a state of tranquility, no matter what odds or evens, ups and downs, good and bad happens to you in your life. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says the believers are the ones who are truly successful in this world and in the hereafter. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions a few things. We're going to talk about just the salat part now. He says, they are the ones who are in their prayers humble. When you believe in Allah truly and you truly follow His guidance, then you will also connect with the one that you love. If you love someone, you want to communicate with them and connect with them. If you love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there's also a way to connect to Him. You don't just neglect Him and turn your back on Him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran that if He says, if my servants ask you about me, I am always close. I am always close. I respond to the person who calls upon me when they call and if they continue to call. So let them respond back to me and let them put their trust in me and their belief in me in the hope that they find successful guidance. So Salat is the first thing in the first way, brothers and sisters, that we must never neglect. Allah tells us not just any type of Salat, any type of prayer. He says those who perform their prayer with humbleness. The Arabic word is khushu' or khashi'un. الَّذِينَ هُمْ فِي صَلَاتِهِمْ خَاشِعُونَ And khushu' is something that is loosely translated as humbleness, uh, tranquility, uh, to be present in the moment, to focus, to concentrate, and it's not an easy feat. And I want to tell you and, give, and put you uh, at rest inshallah ta'ala by saying that the majority of the scholars have agreed that khushu' or this, uh, this form of humbleness and focus in salat is not a condition of your salat's correctness or incorrectness. However, in order to have khushu' the minimum that a person has to do is to be aware of what they're doing and to when they come to their prayer they take a few moments and they refocus and hone in to what they are doing and that is their salat and facing Allah. Then to make your salat with ease with rest, with relaxation, with comfort, and to take your time in your movements. So for example, when you say Allahu Akbar, take your time. And when you recite Al-Fatiha, take your time, for example. When you make Ruku'ah, which is bowing, take a bit more time. When you stand up, take a bit more time. When you go down to Sujood, take a bit more time, and so on. And don't rush it like the pecking of a rooster, as the scholars used to describe. So brothers and sisters, there was once a man, a Sahabi, a companion, who was learning about Islam and learning about prayer. The hadith is in Sahih Muslim and Bukhari, agreed upon. Abu Huraira says, a man once came into the masjid when the Prophet, peace be upon him, was in there, and he prayed two rak'ahs, so the probably the tahiyyat al-masjid, the uh, greeting of uh, the, the masjid when you enter Allah's mosque. He prayed it and then he came and said the greetings of Salam to the Prophet Sallallahu and the Prophet peace be upon him replied Wa Alaikum Salam and the Prophet peace be upon him said to him of course with kindness and wisdom and without embarrassing him he said go back and pray again you have not really prayed. So the man went back and prayed in the way that he understands a second time the Prophet peace be upon him told him go back and pray you haven't prayed. He's prayed a third time and then Rasulullah also said to him, you haven't prayed. That's when the man said, Wallahi, by the one, O oh Rasulullah, Messenger of Allah, by the one who sent you as a messenger in truth, this is the best I know in how to pray. What he was doing was that he was rushing it. He was not standing properly. He was not uh, going into bowing and, and uh, prostration on the floor enough. He was pecking it very quickly. So the Prophet peace be upon him taught him and said, when you come to make salat and prayer, first of all, make your wudu properly. Secondly, when you stand, stand and face the Qibla and take your time. Then when you say Allahu Akbar, recite Al-Fatiha with tranquility and care. Then he said, go to bowing and take your time with bowing. Then stand up from the bowing until you are straight and wait there. Then go down to prostration on the floor and do it and take your time. Then sit and take your time. Then go back to prostration and take your time. He said, Wahakada, and like this, the rest of your prayer. And this is the way the man started to understand and a lesson for all of us that prayer must be prayed with tranquility. So when you do those uh, activities, you are in khushua. All you have to do is minimum take your time in your movements and be aware of what you're saying. And alhamdulillah, you would have tranquility. The more you practice this, the better it becomes. So I've given, uh, I sometimes give people a formula. I call it uh, four by five. So basically it means you need to spend four minutes at least on every two rakahs. Uh, so let's say it's four, then eight minutes. Spend four minutes on every two rakahs. And when you go into your bowing and prostration on the floor, say Subhan Rabbil Azim in bowing five times instead of three. And in your prostration on the floor, say it five times Subhan Rabbil A'la instead of three. 
uh, a person when they come to do their salah, uh, they are secluded with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what it means, it doesn't mean that you have to be in a room that is closed. You, we, we pray in congregation, we pray in front of people, but what it means is that you practice in on uh, isolating the sounds that are around you from paying attention to them and just allow them to be as noises and then focus on what you're doing between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Is it difficult? Yes. Is it doable? Of course. And it takes time, insha'Allah ta'ala. Brothers and sisters, when a person prays and does their salah, one of the things which some people uh, dislike about it is that they have to face the truth. So when you start praying, and you calm down and you relax. In psychology, they, they teach us that in the mind, there is the conscious mind and the subconscious mind. And of course, in Islam, we are also taught that there is Al-Qalb, which is the inner real self of you, your heart and your inner subconscious. That's the true nature of who you are and what you have fed your heart. On the outside, there is consciousness, which means thoughts that come and go. When you relax and hone in and focus and be present in your Salat and take your time, the thoughts that come on the surface of your conscious come and go and they don't just stay. Even if they come along, don't be afraid of them. Don't think that your Salat is going to be ruined because you get thoughts. Everybody goes through that. It's very normal. But it does hone into your subconscious mind. And the more you practice it, the more you will see, inshallah ta'ala, things change in you. Some of the tips that I teach people about Salat to get better at it is other than taking your time. Uh, number two, change the surahs that you read. Everybody recites, for example, Even if you take two or three other verses, minimum three, the scholars say, other verses from any other surah, you don't have to read the whole surah. You can say, for example, And that's it. You don't have to recite the whole thing. Of course, if you know it all, it's better. Also in your bowing, uh, did you know in your bowing and prostration, did you know that there are other words of dhikr that you can say other than the common one that we know, Subhan Rabbi al azim and Subhan Rabbi al ala uh, There is a book called Fortress of the Muslim. You can download it as an app. And in there, uh, there are many uh, different dhikr words that you can say in your bound. There's at least three or four different ones. I'll give you an, uh, one, one of them. One of them is Subuhun Quddusun Rabbul Malaikati wa Ruh. So when you pray, all these movements that you change, it, you refocus again. Rather than just standing still for such a long time, you do lose focus. So then you move and you refocus again. When you change the words that you're saying, then you refocus again because now you have to put the effort in saying something new rather than automatically saying, you know, sometimes our tongues get very, go into autopilot and automated sort of uh, activity. So these are some of the hints that uh, I can give you. Uh, moving on. In the last verse in Surah uh, uh, Al-Mu'minun in verse number nine, Allah says, and those who, got, who guard their prayer. This means that you pray all your five daily prayers, the five compulsory prayers. It is an obligation and to leave one of them is a major sin. And there is a minority view of the scholars, which uh, some great scholars did say, they considered that if you left one of the prayers deliberately without a reason or an excuse, you just didn't want to pray it, then it could be on the verge of even disbelief. Of course, the majority of the scholars said that it is a major sin, so long as you still believe in Allah and His Messenger. But you can see that it's quite uh, severe because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves compulsory things and the compulsory things which He loves, He made them upon us because they are the ones that will save you and make you successful, inshaAllah. So the times of the prayers are obviously Fajr, Dhuhr, Asr, Maghrib and Aisha. Fajr begins at uh, dawn, at the break of dawn, until sunrise. That's the timing. Uh, Zuhr, for example, starts at the zen, with, when the sun rises to the, to the middle and uh, until Asr time. So, for example, from 12.30 till about 3.30 and it keeps changing, of course. Asr finishes at Maghrib or if you can pray it 10 minutes before Maghrib sunset. Maghrib finishes at about 5 minutes before the Isha. And the Isha, there's a difference of opinion. From when it begins until midnight, some of the scholars said, based on the hadith of Prophet to pray before midnight. Some of them took it as an obligation and some of them said it is preferred to pray before midnight. But of course, we uh, the view that I take of the scholars is that you have all the way up to Fajr, but it is better to pray before the midnight. Why did I say this? Some people confuse the hadith of the Prophet, peace be upon him, which says that uh, a person should not delay their prayer and that the most beloved prayers to Allah are the ones done on their time. What does it mean to do it on its time? I had a brother the other day who asked me if I was, say, watching footy or soccer or, or soccer or was doing some kind of hobby of, of my own and then one of the prayers, you know, kicked in and I delayed it a little bit. 
Am I doing shirk? Am I making partners with Allah? Or am I a hypocrite? Am I, or am I sinful? And the answer to that, brothers and sisters, all the scholars unanimously agreed on this, is that it is neither sinful nor is it shirk. In fact, you are permitted to delay your salat from the beginning of its time, uh, even without a reason. So long as you do not pray it outside of its designated time. And the evidence for that is uh, at least two authentic hadiths. One of it is in uh, Dar Qutni, uh, which is uh, authenticated by Shaykh al-Albani, that uh, the Prophet وسلم, said uh, the prayer in the first, in the beginning of it. So let's say the third, I'm just adding the third. So in the beginning of it, it is Rid Allah, Allah's full pleasure. And if you pray it in the middle of the time, then it is Allah's mercy. And if you pray it at the end of its time, it is Allah's pa pardoning, afu. So I'll give you an example. Zuhur starts, let's say, at 12.30 p.m. and ends at Asr time, which is, say, 3.30 p.m. If you pray it between 12.30 and about, you know, 1 o'clock, it's the best. Between 1 o'clock and uh, 2 o'clock, let's say, or 2.30, it is middle ground. And between 2 or 2.30 until just before 3.30, it is still an acceptable salat and a valid one but it takes the pardoning of Allah and each one is better than the other. The other hadith is in Sahih Muslim where the Prophet ﷺ explained to a man about the timings of the prayer and he said to him, these are their times between here to here. And he explained every salat beginning when and ending when. So you can pray any time during that time. Uh, if you're praying congregation and jama'ah in the mosque, it's the best thing, especially for men. Uh, joining the jama'ah and congregation far outweighs praying by yourself at home by 27 degrees. And the scholars said that if you're going to a jama'ah congregation, the congregation happens to be a little bit delayed from the beginning of the of the salat time. Say, for example, 12.30, they prayed at 1. Then it is better to pray with the jama'ah, with the congregation at 1 rather than at 12.30 by yourself. Sister, something to be very careful about is stealing from prayer. And let me tell you, there is a hadith from the Prophet ﷺ, which is narrated by Imam Ahmad and Tirmidhi and others, where he said, the worst types of people are the thieves, the one who thieve and steal from the movements of salah. They steal from the bowing, they steal from the prostration, which means people who barely go into bowing. They get into bowing and don't even wait there and they back up. And when they stand, they barely stand up and they go back down to sujood. When they go into sujood and prostration, they barely even uh, spend some time in sujood. Some of them, even their nose doesn't even touch the ground or some of them, their heads don't even touch the ground. You have to have eight parts of your body in prostrations and they are your forehead, your nose, your palms, both your knees and even both your toes. And the toes have to be uh, on the ground with your feet upwards as you can see with your toes on the ground. And you have to relax until you do them. So hurrying them up and rushing them like the pecking of a rooster is thieving and stealing from your salat. Do not do that. Finally, I just want to say salat is the first thing that we are going to be questioned about on the day of judgment. The Prophet peace be upon him said that the first thing a person, a Muslim, a believer is asked about is there five daily prayers? If it was good, then the, what comes after it is going to be good insha'Allah. And if it was bad, what comes after it is also going to be bad. Of course, this is in general cases, meaning that people who pray all the time are less likely to do too many sins later on. And those who don't pray their pray prayers properly or neglect them, then most likely after it, they're going to be filled with sins because a salah has its special effect on a person. And even a person who prays and does sins, uh, even major sins, they, they may do them. They are very shy and embarrassed of them and they feel guilt and sensitivity about them and they repent insha'Allah ta'ala very quickly or soon. So there is a big difference between a person who has a connect connection with Allah and one who doesn't. So uh, let's say for example that uh, you are uh, on the day of judgment and your prayers, your five daily prayers are brought. Some people they pray them better than others. And I want you to imagine salat like, uh, imagine a lever. Or, or, or a, you know, a tube with, with liquid in it, and it's got um, uh, levels and, and measurements. Uh, each salat that you pray during your life, some are better than the others, they're at different levels in that measurement. So on a day of judgment, imagine your salat, your compulsory prayers are measured. Some of them are high, some of them are low, some of them are not complete to the best. So then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to his angels, does my servant have any voluntary prayers? Does he have, for example, the 12 sunnahs that you used to pray, such as the two before Fajr, four before Dhuhr, two after Dhuhr, two after Maghrib, and two after Aisha? Uh, in some schools of thought, there's four before Asr, plus maybe the Witr, uh, plus maybe uh, Salat al-Duha, which is from uh, after 15 minutes after sunrise until about 
10 minutes before the sun reaches its zenith, meaning at dhuhr is called Salat al-Duha, and many other prayers like the night prayer or any kind of Salat that you offer. Then the angels said, Yes, Ya Rabb. They say, Our Lord, they, they do have these voluntary prayers. So Allah says, Add them on top of the compulsory prayers, and it completes it. So, brothers and sisters, don't leave the voluntary prayers out. It's not a sin to leave them out, but it is a huge loss of the enormous rewards that come with it. One of the hadiths, which is also authentic, says that whoever prays the 12 sunnahs of the day will have a house or a palace built for them in paradise. Imagine that every day, subhanAllah, in your paradise and your garden. If a person is praying out in the park or on a farm or somewhere far, let's say, and uh, you cannot get to, for example, a mosque or a place to pray, uh, whether you're uh, alone or with people, mostly actually when you are alone, and the time of prayer comes in. Then the Prophet ﷺ said, and the, uh, the hadith is also uh, authentic in, in at tabari he said, if a person prays in a field and they're alone, and they pray without making the adhan or the iqama, then they are praying by themselves and they receive the reward for themselves. But if they make the iqama, then his two angels, they pray with him. And if he makes the adhan just by himself in this field or this park, and the iqama, and then prays, many angels pray behind that person in rows. And another hadith, uh, he said, as far as the east is from the west behind that person, subhanAllah. This is how the angels, they love salat. And so long as you are in salat, and when you stay after salat, you make a tasbih and everything, the angels also make dua for you to forgive you and to pardon you and so on. In relation to our sisters, I mentioned that if a person is out in the field and makes the adhan and iqama, the angels pray behind them. Well, does this apply to women as well? Should they also call out the adhan and the iqama in the field? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best, but adhan and iqama is for men. However, if a woman, a Muslim woman, is in the field or in the farm and she intends, she wants that reward, but obviously she uh, respects the deen and what the Prophet ﷺ taught us, then insha'Allah, God willing, Allah SWT will give her also that reward because of her intentions, insha'Allah ta'ala. Uh, furthermore, some people ask me, well, what about women? Should they pray in congregation, in jama'ah, in the mosque? And will they miss out on a 27 reward since the men get it? Well, sisters, yours is a little bit different. You've got something special for you. Rasul Prophet wasallam said that the best place for a woman to pray is in her house, in her bedroom. We're talking about the five daily prayers, of course. But also praying in the masjid is virtuous for her as well. The Prophet, peace be upon him, for example, said, don't even prevent your wives, your women, from going to the masjid at night because men used to say to them don't go out at night if you have no need for you know for them there's no real reason why uh, a wife needs to stay at home then going to the masjid at night uh, is virtuous so i want to say that for women subhanallah if your intention is because you want the great reward like the men get that reward then you have a free reward just by having that intention and that desire so whether you pray at home or you pray in the masjid with that intention inshallah ta'ala I hope some of the scholars said that you will get that 27 degrees and rewards. But of course, praying at home, the reason for that is uh, Islam always encourages uh, to always uh, encourages us to have less um, uh, mixing or seeing each other, even though it's not haram for men to see the women at the mosque or for them to see the men at the mosque. However, it is there's always something that is better. So. Pray your salat, my brothers and sisters, make it your food and drink in your life. Teach your children and be patient with it. And you'll see, inshallah, God willing, a change in your life and in your family's life. And most of all, in the hereafter. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us among the musalleen. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us among those whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, believers are the ones who have truly reached success. Ameen. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Wa alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.